hello students uh so welcome to a uh, recall session iicit may 2024 pharmacology so this session is purely based on uh, recall uh, from the students so there might be some mistake if mistake if any mistake is there in the question or in the option please let us know please let us know in the comment section like that we will try to correct those things so before going to discuss about all the questions uh let me put uh, the sub uh, what do you call the weightage from the each uh, uh chapter so from general pharmacology and from um cns pvs these are all the chapters diuretics and then chemotherapy or antimicrobials whatever it might be endocrinology cancer chemotherapy uh blood and then respiratory system so these are the chapters from which we got the questions almost like we got 24 questions so we got almost three questions from general pharmacology three questions from cns cvs we got one question and then diuretics we got two questions related to kidney and then uh, from chemotherapy we got four questions on endocrinology we got seven questions this was a uh, highest endocrinology seven questions this was the highest one highest one from pharmacology and then coming to cancer chemotherapy we got one question blood we got one question and respiratory system we got almost two questions so it's almost around we got 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 20 almost we got 24 questions we got from pharmacology so we'll start from uh, chapter first we start with general pharmacology gradually i'll finish all the general pharmacology questions and next i will go to the next chapter uh, so we'll start our session ma so this was the first question a very easy one in competitive non competitive inhibition from pharmacodynamics which of the following statements regarding the drugs shown in the graph a and graph b so like drug a drug b is correct so this is a and this is b he has given clearly it is a so before going to uh, discuss whether it is a competitive or non competitive inhibition let me put uh, this thing in front of you so that you will understand everything so line weaver bulk plots so we have competitive inhibition we have non competitive inhibition here so as you know in competitive inhibition so before going to uh, this competitive or non competitive so here we have x axis and then y axis in the x axis we have substrate concentration that means to say we are going to discuss something about km here on the x axis on the y axis we have velocity of the reaction so we are going to interpret v max so on the x axis so x axis it is something related to k max km sorry it's km and then on y axis we have v max this is what the thing which you already know which you already know now now let's in a simple way you see so here it is a no input that means it is like a normal graph normal graph with the inhibitor we got this graph red color one so here if you can see here if you can see here both lines are touching in at y axis that means to say v max is not affected there that means v max is remains same v max is unaffected and finally they are having different points on x axis that means to say km is different for those two that means km is increased here if you come to non competitive inhibition here if you can see they both are touching on x axis that means km is unaffected km is unaffected that was the thing here km is unaffected and vmax you can see vmax vmax is changed here so if both lines are touching on x axis that means to say km is unaffected if km is unaffected that means it is non competitive inhibition if both lines are touching at y axis that means to say v max is unaffected that means to say it is competitive inhibition competitive inhibition so and in non competitive inhibition no crossing nothing no touching at all see on x axis they are at different places on y axis also they are at different places that means both are reduced both are reduced now we can see here here you can see in a a graph a here they both are touching at y axis y axis they are touching that means to say v max is unaffected and km is reduced km is reduced 
sorry, came is increased here. Sorry, came is increased here. Now, in graph B, here you can see they both are touching on x axis. If they both are touching on x axis, that means to say KM is unaffected, KM is unaffected on Vmax. Vmax is reduced here, decreased, decreased. So this is competitive, this is B is non competitive. Or it is clear for everyone. So A is competitive, okay. So definitely not C, not D. So A is competitive, B is non competitive. So B will be the answer. B will be the answer. And then one more thing I would like to tell here what will happen to potency and efficacy in competitive inhibition? See, in competitive inhibition, in non -com in competitive inhibition, potency decreases. In non competitive inhibition, efficacy decreases. You can remember with the mnemonic like a none. In non competitive inhibition, efficacy is decreasing. Efficacy is decreasing. So, this is what the thing here. So, again, uh, important, uh, maybe the next expected thing. So, now let's come to second one. Second one. So, now. Which of the following drugs is or are used for cyanide poisoning? He is asking something about cyanide poisoning. So we give four options. Let's talk a little bit about cyanide poisoning. So what is this cyanide is doing? It has more affinity for more affinity for just more affinity for cytochrome oxidase, cytochrome oxidase, which is responsible for ATP production. So it will go on, it will go and interfere with the cytochrome oxidase. So obviously decreased ATP production, everything will be there. Now, what we have to do? We have to remove the cyanide from the body. So now how we will do that part? Cyanide has more of a need towards methemoglobin. So what we have to do? We have to convert hemoglobin to methemoglobin. We have abundance of hemoglobin in the body. How to convert hemoglobin to methemoglobin? By giving, by giving. Amyl nitrite, sodium nitrite. By giving amyl nitrite, sodium nitrite, we can convert to methemoglobin. This methemoglobin, this cyanide has more, more, more affinity towards methemoglobin. Cyanide has more affinity towards more affinity towards methemoglobin. So cyanide combines with the methemoglobin. Cyanide combines with the methemoglobin in form. Cyanomethemoglobin. This is also a toxic compound. Cyanomethemoglobin is also a toxic compound. So this cyanomethemoglobin, again, again, we need to convert this cyanomethemoglobin to some more product so that it will get excreted. How we will give, how we will convert by giving sodium thiosulfate. By giving sodium thiosulfate, we convert cyanomethemoglobin to We convert to sodium thiocyanate. Because sodium thiocyanate, this sodium thiocyanate get eliminated. Gets eliminated. This is how we are going to treat the cyanide poisoning. Now you can see it here. We are giving amyl nitrite, sodium nitrate, and sodium thiosulfate. So amyl nitrate, sodium nitrate, sodium thiosulfate. So these are the drugs which you will use for cyanide poisoning. And one more thing, if they ask you antidote. Antidote, antidote of cyanide poisoning, hydroxycobalamin. Hydroxycobalamin is an antidote of cyanide poisoning. Here you can see these are the kits which are present for cyanide poisoning. We have amyl nitrate, sodium nitrate. It convert these are the methemoglobin inducers. So convert this metho hemoglobin to methmo methemoglobin, and cyanide has more affinity, and it forms cyanomethemoglobin. That's what I told. Next, we have sodium thiosulfate. The sodium thiosulfate combines with cyanomethemoglobin and it forms sodium thiocyanate, which is excreted renally. Renally. So these are the three drugs which we use: amyl nitrate, sodium nitrate, and sodium thiosulfate. I hope it is clear with the cyanide poison. Next, third question. 
which of the following is a suicide inhibitor which of the following is a suicide inhibitor before going to the suicide inhibitor what do you mean by this suicide inhibitor suicide inhibitors are also known as irreversible inhibitors irreversible inhibitors before going to examples and everything let me put little bit like inhibitors inhibitors classically they are divided into reversible inhibitors irreversible inhibitors okay these reversible inhibitors these are competitive and then non competitive as well non competitive as well which we discussed before irreversible how they bind irreversibly with the help of covalent bonds with the help of covalent bonds they bind irreversibly now after uh, binding so they are literally they are going to inhibit that one so finally enzyme does nothing that is why we call it as suicide inhibitor suicide inhibitor now what are all the examples of suicide inhibitor see suicide inhibitors like just uh, remember this thing if for your internal exam if they give more chapters for an exam definitely we will just uh, get that kind of uh, thought like it's better to commit suicide than to write the exam right generally don't do that one but we have that part more chapters more chapters if they put for internal exam if they put more chapters for the internal exam definitely we'll get the thought to commit the suicide instead of writing the exam so chapters is a mnemonic for all suicide inhibitors all suicide inhibitors so now what are all the examples see clopidogrel H, heparin, E, aspirin, and then P, proton pump inhibitors, propyl thioiracil, propyl thioiracil, T, cyclopidine, cyclopidine, E. Ethinyl estradiol, ethinyl estradiol, R, R, ritonavir, ritonavir, and yes, we have spironol, lactone, telegilin, telegilin, and then secobarbital. Psychobarbital. These are all the drugs which are responsible, which are examples of suicidal inhibitors. Along with, along the, we have like one very famous example. Along with these chapters, we have one very famous example: OP compound. OP compounds. So these are all the examples of suicide inhibitors. OP compounds. OP compounds. They are going to bind irreversibly with acetylcholinesterase enzyme, right? So now we'll see what are all the examples which we, he has given. We have ritonavir. Yes, ritonavir is it is a suicide inhibitor. Spironolactone is a suicide inhibitor. Ethinyl estradiol is also a suicide inhibitor. So these are these three are suicide inhibitors. Then what is this benzbromerone? What is this different benzbromerone? This benzbromerone, it is a reversible inhibitor. It is a reversible inhibitor of urate transporter one. It is a reversible inhibitor of urate transporter 1 used in the treatment of gout. So that's all about uh, the suicide inhibitors. Now, co coming to the next question, which of the following can be used for the quick reversal of vecuronium? Vecuronium. As you know, as you know, it is a clear cut direct question, Sugamadex. So, Sugamadex is useful for the quick reversal of two things. One is vecuronium and then Rocuronium. But the, these two, uh, we use Sugamadex. The neostigmine, other than Vicuronium, Rocuronium, then for majority of the neuromuscular block, reversal of neuromuscular blockers, we use neostigmine. Then what is this Edrophonium? Edrophonium useful for diagnosis of myasthenia gravis. Useful for the diagnosis of myasthenia gravis. Next, atropine. As you know, it is an antidote of OP compound poison. It is an antidote of 
op compound poison so that's all that's all about quick reversal of acronym sugamedex so answer is sugamedex next so the inhalational anesthetic agent of choice in he asked about children here there are two things one is he asked in children and the second one is he asked inhalational if, here there are two things if we directly if we put anesthetic agent, agent of choice for induction in children we go for propofol but he asked inhalational agent so in children in children for induction if we give iv predominantly we give iv propofol but for inhalational inhalational we use sevoflurane greater than halothane halothane so answer is sevoflurane it has sweet order it has sweet order it has sweet order a yes, sweet order so let's talk a few points with the sevoflurane so what are all the important points with the sevoflurane all the important points with the sevoflurane can be remembered with a mnemonic uh, bedside bedside so it is a bronchodilator it is a most effective bronchodilator number 1 and number 2 it is associated with emergency delirium in children it is associated with emergency delirium in children and then d it is useful for day care surgery it is useful for a day care surgery and then yes so this sevoflurane sevoflurane with the soda line with the soda line in closed circuit in closed circuit leads to production of compound a which leads to nephrotoxicity due to compound a due to compound a next it is used for induction induction it has sweet order sevoflurane and halothane both have sweet order both have sweet order sweet order so that's all about all the points with the sevoflurane and then little i will talk little bit two points with the halothane also halothane halothane the first three letters h a l h a l hal right halothane it is associated with the hepatitis halothane hepatitis we call it as halothane hepatitis it is a immunological reaction immunological reaction it is an immunological reaction which is due to trifluoroacetyl chloride it is due to metabolite trifluoroacetyl chloride next next one more hitch it is sensitize heart to catecholamines it sensitize heart to catecholamines so that so it is contraindicated in pheochromocytoma next a it is used in asthma is because it is a effective bronchodilator it is also used in asthma next l it is a light sensitive compound so it is stored in amber color bottle so halothane hcl it is associated with halothane hepatitis and then sensitize heart to catecholamines and it is used in asthma it is a light sensitive compound now there is one more question the patient with a halothane hepatitis can we give halothane it has past history of halothane hepatitis what we have to give what we have to give past history uh sorry past history past history of halothane hepatitis sevoflurane we can use sevoflurane we can use use sevoflurane past history of halothane hepatitis use sevoflurane so that's all that's all about uh, inhalation anesthetic uh, agent of choice in the children next coming to next question cannabinoids cannabinoids not approved here you see it's not approved it's it is not approved not approved for the 
treatment of so as you know these cannabinoids these cannabinoids these are approved for the treatmenting approved for the treatmenting lennox gestert syndrome lennox gestert syndrome dravet syndrome dravet syndrome and then tuberous sclerosis tuberous sclerosis this is approved for the treatment of these three so lennox gestert syndrome dravet syndrome tuberous sclerosis it is approved so not approved for rett syndrome so not not approved for rett syndrome so it is approved it is approved it is approved so rett syndrome is the answer so then rett syndrome what is approved for rett syndrome trophinitide this was a so again this was a question which was asked like i think one year back trophinitide trophinitide approved for rett rett syndrome trophinitide next coming to which of the following is a pcsk9 inhibitor again a very important topic the dyslipidemias so pcsk9 inhibitors we have we have two drugs ivolocumab ivolocumab alirocumab so these are the two drugs which are present under pcsk9 inhibitors so ivolocumab is the answer ivolocumab is the answer next what is this azetamib then this azetamib this is going to inhibit the cholesterol absorption inhibit the cholesterol absorption by inhibiting by inhibiting npc1l1 transporter transport this is going to absorb the cholesterol you inhibit the transport so cholesterol absorption is decreased from the intestine then what is this lomitabide see clearly the name itself m t p so this lomitabide lomitabide is a mtp inhibitor that means to say microsomal triglyceride transfer inhibitor microsomal triglyceride transfer inhibitor next what is this torsetrapib the name itself again it is saying again it is saying set p inhibitor set p inhibitor so this let me put in another color it is a set p inhibitor cholesterol ester uh, transfer protein inhibitor which is going to increase hdl this is going to increase hdl that's all about this pcs can inhibitor portion and then coming to this one the drugs reducing mortality the drugs reducing mortality in ckd patients now let me show few points clearly these are the points taken from goodman gilman clearly here it shows it shows pendrinone was fda approved for the reduce to reduce the risk of end stage renal disease cardiovascular death and heart failure in the diabetic patients with the ckd so it is going to reduce the risk of end stage kidney so pendrinone it is the one which reduces the mortality next in type 2 diabetes glyphosin glyphosin are nothing but canagliflozin dapagliflozin empagliflozin they protect against declining the renal function end stage kidney disease death due to kidney disease and acute kidney injury so they are going to protect us against this end stage renal disease so sgld2 inhibitors those are nothing but glyphosins and then fenrenone and then coming to one more thing here you can see ac inhibitors arbs are the effective in slowing the progression of renal failure in the patient with advanced stages of both diabetic and non diabetic ckd so it is going to slowing down the progression of renal failure so ac is and arbs so this is also so these three reduce the mortality in ckd patients reduce the mortality in ckd patients next Uh, again, a very easy question. Which of the following diuretic diuretic is correctly matched with the site of action? Correctly matched with the site of action. Okay, we'll see. Uh, mannitol, mannitol, loop of Henle. Mannitol, this loop of Henle. Acetazolamide. It is going to act proximal tubules. Proximal tubules. Furosemide. Thick ascending limb. Thick ascending limb. Furosemide. Thick ascending limb. 
pyrolactone potassium sparing diuretics act at collecting ducts act at collecting ducts act at collecting ducts thiazides they are going to act at distal tubules thiazides they are going to act at distal tubules again very easy question this is very easy question this is next which of the following drugs are useful in the treatment of leprosy can result in so leprosy can result in hyperpigmentation hyperpigmentation now we see so these are the drugs used in the leprosy now we will see one by one what are the characteristic areas of each drug dapsone dapsone it is associated with hemolysis hemolysis in g6pd deficiency individuals and then it is also associated with cutaneous reactions like cutaneous adrs like 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 itching prurite it is associated with these two characteristic adrs next as you know ofloxacin chloroquinolone they are associated with tendon rupture the rifampicin you know red orange urine red orange color urine coming to this clofazimine clofazimine is the one which is associated with red black blue or violet this colorization this is a dye actually this is a dye this is a dye this is this is associated with skin hyperpigmentation this is associated with skin hyperpigmentation so what is little uh, two or three points with clofazimine so what is this clofazimine clofazimine it is a leprostatic agent along with this have anti inflammatory properties also so where we use this clofazimine clofazimine indications clofazimine indications this is used in leprosy leprosy treatment and this is also used in lepra reactions lepra reactions and is also used in multi drug resistant tb multi drug resistant tb so this is associated with a skin hyperpigmentation that's all about this uh, leprosy here you can see this is how this is how this is how here you can see all skin pigmentations pigmentations of clofazimine this is due to deposition of the drug this is due to deposition of drug okay that's all next the patient with a known allergy of penicillin here clue known allergy to penicillin presents with enterococcal endocarditis which of the following drug can be used safely safely in a patient who is allergic to penicillin as you know this enterococcal endocarditis we all know this enterococcal endocarditis first line drug first line drug is penicillin with aminoglycosides not all aminoglycosides only two aminoglycosides which are gentamicin and then streptomycin these are the only two amino glycosides which are approved for the treatment of enterococcal endocarditis next if patient is allergic then alternative will be alternative will be vancomycin 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 so entero now here we have two kind of questions ma so now this enterococcus is a gram positive bacteria so in gram positive bacteria if there is patient is allergic to penicillin we go for vancomycin if the same question same question gram negative bacteria allergic to penicillin okay allergic to penicillin so here it is vancomycin but the same question gram negative bacteria allergic to penicillin means we give astreonum we go for astreonum we go for astreonum if it is gram negative gram negative okay how about is clear for everyone next one drug resistance is most commonly seen with the following infection so drug resistance is most commonly seen with what now okay chancroid dermatosis syphilis and gonorrhea so the answer is again a very easy question it is a gonorrhea the red because it was previously we used penicillin so now we are using ceftriaxone ceftriaxone now let's talk little bit about drug of choices or most effective drugs in the remaining options chancroid azithromycin azithromycin single dose azithromycin or we can use ceftriaxone next donovanosis azithromycin azithromycin syphilis penicillin g these are all the uh, drug of choice or most effective drugs for the treatment of the remaining infections next
false statement about this oreconazole i know this is a bit eccentric question uh majority of the people you might have not answered correctly fine these kind of questions will be there which even pg students cannot answer them fine no problem even if you cannot answer but you need to answer all those easy kind of or micro moderate kind of questions. these kind of high level bounces will be there fine no problem this oreconazole he gave all the options here now let's i'll tell you all the points which are present in the goodman gilman here you can see clearly they have mentioned clearly they have mentioned uh, high fat meals reduces the bioavailability high fat meals they reduce the bioavailability so oral drug should be given either one hour before or one hour after the meal so predominantly we can give with empty stomach because it is going to absorb decrease the bioavailability so this is a true statement next here you can see patient with mild to moderate cirrhosis should receive the same <coughs> loading dose of oriconazole but half to the maintenance that means to say we have to give it in in the form of loading dose this is also a true statement here also he has given therapeutic drug monitoring is frequently used so this is also a true statement this is also a true statement next see here in adverse effects occasional cases of hepatotoxicity oriconazole is associated with hepatotoxicity what is this pyrazinamide this pyrazinamide also anti tubercular drug which is also associated with hepatotoxicity so we he has given it should be given with pyrazinamide no no because hepatotoxicity increases so it should not be given with a pyrazinamide and we have still few queries with this question mark whether it is a true statement about oriconazole false statement about oriconazole whether it should be given with pyrazinamide should not be given with pyrazinamide taken on empty stomach not taken on empty stomach these kind of options are a bit confusing please let us know about this question as far as my research this is what the question but if still if there are any uh, uh, changes to be done please let us know please let us know next a uh, 30 year uh, old woman has experienced the loss of her newborn since she is currently producing breast milk leading to discomfort and risk of developing a breast abscess due to breast milk stasis and incomplete emptying which of the following drug okay can be used to prevent this complication so here it is due to increased prolactin increased prolactin so hyperprolactinoma hyperprolactinoma we have two drugs two drugs in order to treat bromocyptin bromocyptin and then we have cabergolin cabergolin what are the main differences between these two bromocyptin and cabergolin bromocyptin it has short half life it has long half life this cabergolin is a drug of choice for a drug of choice for hyperprolactinoma almost all cases of hyperprolactinoma cabergolin is a drug of choice cabergolin but 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 if pregnancy is desired if they mention in that question if they want pregnancy then only we can go for bromocyptin this bromocyptin again we use it in type 2 diabetes mellitus type 2 diabetes mellitus so here it is obviously cabergolin cabergolin is a drug of choice for majority of the cases of hyperprolactinoma but remember remember if pregnancy is desired then we go for bromocyptin and it is also used in diabetes so that's all that's all about this question mark and the next which of the following is an adverse effect with a long term use of intermittent teriparatide so teriparatide adverse effects okay here is given fine okay so what is this teriparatide teriparatide the name itself ending with id that means to say we give via subcutaneous para para that means something it is related to para hormone it is a recombinant para hormone recombinant para hormone so where we use this one usually in the cases of severe osteoporosis usually in the case of therapeutic use is severe osteoporosis next how it is going to act it is going to promote bone formation it is going to promote bone formation how long we can give not more than 2 years not more than 2 years why due to development of osteosarcoma it should be given less than 2 years not more than 2 years now what are the adrs of teriparatide what are the adrs of teriparatide these adrs of teriparatide you can remember with the mnemonic of four eyes four eyes 
four eyes. So now, uh, yes, um, clearly that answer clear. Obviously, we know as I told you, it should not be given more than two years means due to risk of osteosarcoma. So osteosarcoma is the answer here. But these osteonecrosis of jaw and subtrochanter fracture, these are seen with the bisphosphonates. These are seen with the bisphosphonates. Now, coming back to the ADRs, ADRs of teriparatide, P, sorry, uh, contraindications, sorry, it's not ADRs, contraindications of teriparatide, contraindications, Paget's disease, Paget's disease, osteosarcoma, osteosarcoma, urolithiasis, urolithiasis, that is renal stones, I see. That means to say, increased calcium levels in due to increased calcium level conditions. Increased calcium level conditions. So this is what the mnemonic for contraindications of teriparatide or eyes. Generally, if you want to put anything uh, like a mocktail or cocktail, it might be. So first we need to put ice in the glass. Then only we put uh, all the liquid. So poor eyes, Paget's disease, osteosarcoma, urolithiasis, and increased calcium level. This is, these are the all the contraindications of contraindications of periparatide. And then remember, it is going to promote the bone formation. It has nothing to do with the bone resorption. This postponates to it decreases the bone resorption. But this periparatide is going to promote the bone formation. And then remember, it is not used more than two years due to risk of osteosarcoma. Osteosarcoma. That's all about teriparatidma. Which of the following anti-diabetic drug is associated with increased risk of urinary tract infections? This question it has asked n number of times in INICT and as well as NEPG entrance exam. So increased risk of urinary tract infection, as you already know, all glyphosins, glyphosins, that is nothing but SGLT2 inhibitors, all the drugs ending with glyphosins. Cana diflosin, DAPA diflosin, EMPA diflosin. So here, DAPA diflosin, DAPA diflosin. Let's talk a little bit about these SGLT2 inhibitors. So these SGLT2, it is present in the proximal convoluted tubule. What it is going to do? It is going to reabsorb. It is going to reabsorb 90% of the glucose. And the remaining less than 10% is absorbed by SGLT1, SGLT1. Fine, leave that one. So it is going to reabsorb 90% of the glucose. So what what if we inhibit this one? If we inhibit that one, there is no reabsorption of glucose, there is no reabsorption, all glucose will be flown through the urine. So all that urinary tract, all the urethra, everything it has glucose loaded content. So it is mostly prone for bacterial infections. That's how we get urinary tract infections here. Now let me put all the main uh, points or pickup lines with the diabetes mellitus drugs. Ma. Here you can see. The drug which is associated with the lactic acidosis, I can tell you it is a metformin. 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 And the next, the metformin most common area. This was again, this was again a recent question which was asked. Most it is associated with the nausea, vomiting and diarrhea associated with abdominal cramps. With abdominal cramps. With abdominal cramps. Next, disulfiram-like reaction. Disulfiram-like reaction, which is associated with chlorpropamide. Chlorpropamide belong to sulfonyl ureas. And then, GIT-related areas, predominantly bloating, flatulence, and which are contraindicated in intestinal disorders. Which are contraindicated in intestinal disorders. These are alpha glucosidase inhibitors. A carbose and oglibose, and then very important drugs which are used in heart failure. Used in heart failure are SGLT2 inhibitors, and the drugs which are contraindicated in heart failure, contraindicated heart failure, glitazone, that is thioglit pioglitazone and rosiglitazone. Pioglitazone. Proceed, and the associated UTA, as you already know, 
SGLT2 inhibitors. And then here comes a very important thing: type two diabetes mellitus with cardiovascular disease and drugs decreasing the cardiovascular events. These canagliflozin and empagliflozin with SGLT2 inhibitors or gliflozins, gliflozins used in heart failure. Again, a very important one, which is going to decrease the cardiovascular death. This is typically DAPA gliflozin. DAPA gliflozin. So DAPA gliflozin D. It is going to decrease the death. It is going to decrease the deaths. So that's all about all the pickup lines. All these are pickup lines. Anti-diabetes mellitus drugs very important, ma. Very important. And then, which of the following anti-diabetic drug is associated with unexplained diarrhea? Just now we have discussed. Metformin. Metformin is associated with the diarrhea. That is the most common ADR. For suppose, for suppose, if it is associated, if they if they would have given, ah, uh, what you call, ah, uh, alpha glucosidase inhibitors, go for alpha glucosidase inhibitors. Next, metformin. Generally, he don't give. If he give, go for alpha glucosidase inhibitors. Now let's talk about all the ADRs associated with each option. Pioglitazone. It is associated with P. P means urine. It is associated with. bladder cancer and increase the weight due to fluid retention and then increased risk of fractures increased risk of fractures and then ceta gliptin gliptin is associated with nasopharyngeal carcinoma nasopharyngeal cancer glimepiride nothing much metformin as i already i told you nausea vomiting diarrhea they are the most common ADRs associated abdominal cramps and it is associated with lactic acidosis that is the reason why we ask the patient to go for rfts every year the patient who is using metformin he should go undergo rft so this is what the statement direct uh, lines from the goodman gilman metformin it is most common side effects most common side effects nausea indigestion abdominal cramps bloating and diarrhea this is what the direct line from the goodman gilman next most potent natural estrogen most to again Direct statement: Natural estrogen, E two greater than E one greater than E three. So this is what the thing here: E two greater than E one greater than E three. So the most important one is estradiol. Most important one is estradiol. Direct question: An anti-diabetic drug used for the treatment of heart failure with low. I ask it here. Sorry. They ask it here. Treatment of heart failure. That means used in heart failure. So used in heart failure. All that I cover is GLT two inhibitors. Suppose if there is a contraindicated in heart failure, then you go for pio glitazones or rosy glitazone. Pio glitazone or rosy glitazone. Contraindicated in heart failure and used in heart failure. So DAPA glitazone. DAPA glitazone. Papa glucose. Next, a uh, twenty-eight year old pregnant, thirty-two weeks of. Uh, see, if you get these kind of lengthy questions, what I suggest you, what I suggest you is, start from the last line. Start from the last line. Here you see, choose the correct option. Should be used for fetal lung maturation. He just ask it. He gave some clinical scenario and he just ask it. Choose the correct option for fetal lung maturation. Now we you know the answer. Fine. Now we'll come back here. Uh, 32 weeks of gestation with obstetric clinical signs and symptoms of preterm labor. Medical team decides to administer corticosteroids to promote fetal lung maturation, reduce the risk of neonatal respiratory distress syndrome. So now we have beta methazone. We have dexa methazone. Remember, remember, beta methazone, dexa methazone. Predominantly we give dexa methazone. Now. We have to give twenty four milligrams, twenty four milligrams in forty eight hours. The time is forty eight hours, forty eight hours. How to give that one? Here you see, this is B. B is a second letter. That means we give two doses, two doses. If you want to give two doses, then how you will divide this twenty four milligrams? So twelve milligrams, twelve milligrams. You are giving it for two doses. Two doses. I told you, we should give in forty-eight hours. Two doses means twelve milligram for every twenty-four hours. So ultimately, two doses. Now the same with the dexamethasone. The same with the dexamethasone. We need to give twenty-four milligram. 
the time is 48 hours 48 hours so but here it is a fourth letter d that means to say you are giving four doses four doses if you are giving four doses that means to say 24 divided by 4 is 6 milligram 6 milligram so 6 milligram divided by again 48 hours 48 hours if it, if you want to divide 48 hours into four doses means for every 12 hours we need to give for every 12 hours we need to give so dexamethasone 6 milligram 12 hourly for four doses is the correct answer correct answer i hope it is clear for uh, everyone regarding the fetal lung maturation next uh, all of the following drugs are the inhibitors of h R1 receptor except R1 receptor except now epidermal growth factor receptors they are divided into two categories epidermal growth factor 1 epidermal growth factor 2 R1 receptors and R2 receptors R1 receptors R2 receptors so what are all the drugs which are present in R1 receptors oh, sorry R1 blockers and R2 blocker inhibitors R1, Cetuximab, 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 Panitumumab, Nesitumumab. These are the three drugs which are monoclonal antibodies, which are monoclonal antibodies. If you want a tyrosine kinase inhibitors, it is Jefitinib and Erlotinib also, Jefitinib and Erlotinib. Next, coming to R2, we have Trastuzumab, Trastuzumab, we have Artuzumab, we have Artuzumab. And coming to Tyrosine kinase inhibitors, we have Lapartinib, we have Lapartinib. So these are all the drugs. So all drugs inhibitors of R1 except. So let's see what are R1. Cetuximab is 2, Panitumab is 2, Nesitumumab is 2. So Pertuzumab is R2 inhibitor. So this is a correct answer. So these drugs are useful for the treatment of breast cancer. Breast cancer. Cetuximab is useful for the treatment of head and neck cancer. Especially during radiotherapy, head and neck cancer, we use this one. This trastuzumab, it is a cardiotoxic drug which decreases the left ventricular ejection fraction. It is going to decrease left ventricular ejection fraction. So that's all about this HER1, HER2. Next. Uh, which of the following anticoagulants require? You see here it is require. Require uh, monitoring, profile that is lab monitoring, lab monitoring. Okay. Let me put what are all the anticoagulants which are present. Anticoagulants. Anticoagulants predominantly we have parenteral and we have oral, oral, parenteral, oral. So, parenteral, what are all the drugs we have? We have unfractionated heparin, we have low molecular weight heparin, these are the drugs end with parin, end with the parin, and three we have. Honda, Parinux, and four we have direct thrombin inhibitors. These are Argatroban and all the drugs ending with the rudin. All drugs ending with rudin. So drugs ending with rudin. So they are obtained from high rudin, high rudin. And coming to oral, what are all the drugs which are present? Vitamin K antagonist that is warfarin. Next, we have direct factor 10A inhibitors. These factor 10A inhibitors are rivaroxaban and then apixaban, and then we have direct thrombin inhibitors, which is dabi gatran. Dabi gatran. So these are all the uh, what do you call anticoagulants which are present now. Now here I'll tell you monitoring is required for for vitamin. I'll write here. Monitoring is required for warfarin. 
monitoring is required for unfractionated heparin and monitoring is required for direct thrombin inhibitors here diwali routine so now these are the three where monitoring is required and then and then these two and then these two lab monitoring is not required for these two and these two lab monitoring is not required monitoring is not required now you see he asked requires so requires means so obviously these are the drugs ending with the parin parin obviously it is not required ponda parinex also not required dabigatran also not required so lepirudine all the drugs ending with the rudine required so that's all requires so in this question he may ask you which requires lab monitoring which doesn't require lab monitoring so just remember requires lab monitoring means unfractionated heparin warfarin and a drug ending with rudin drug ending and, and also argatrobin these are the drugs which require lab monitoring i hope it is clear for everyone blood a very important chapter every year he, every year he will ask one question related to anticoagulants or related to antiplatelets now here comes next question 30 year old patient pres uh, presented with a fever cough and tenacious white sputum which of the following should be used okay fine tenacious white sputum that means to say it is a productive cough productive cough so for treatment of cough generally we have we have antitussis and we have mucolytics which thin make the sputum thin so that it will get excreted these antitussis are useful for useful for dry cough it is going to stop the cough mucolytics are useful for productive cough they are useful for productive cough next this so what are the examples of antitussis codeine dextromethorphan dextromethorphan noscapin all antihistamines like chlorophyll remain maleate all those things on coming to mucolytics mostly ambroxol ambroxol and then we have bromhexine so here you can see codeine it is used is it is antitussis dextromethorphan is antitussis here we have bromhexine and here also we have bromhexine a and d but why we need to use dextromethorphan we need not to stop the cough we need not to stop the cough so no need so it is also antitussis so syrup bromhexine is the one for productive cough we use syrup bromhexine next inhalational nitric oxide inhalational nitric oxide obviously persistent pulmonary hypertension so this inhalational nitric oxide which has fd approved only for one indication that is persistent pulmonary hypertension so it has only one indication ma that's all that's all about all 24 questions if still if any question is left from pharmacology please let us know and if there are any uh, bit error because these are based on recall by the students if there are any errors with respect to question or with respect to options please let us know uh, we will try to rectify them uh, thank you so much thank you